Hello, Internet. We are live. Hey, everyone. Welcome to episode 53 of the Stanford MLSS Seminar Series. I'm Karan, and as always, we have with us Stan. Hey. Yudor. Hello. Yuro. Hello. Matei. And our guest today, Cody Coleman, who Matei will be formally introducing in a second. Um, I just want to tell everybody what we do here. So as always, we're going to do a 30-minute talk, followed by a 30-minute podcast-style discussion where you in the live audience can ask questions. You can send in questions during the talk as well, and we'll keep track of them. Uh, so I just want to toss over to Matei very quickly and, and have him introduce Cody for us. All right, great. Yeah, well, it's my pleasure to introduce Cody Coleman, our speaker today. Uh, Cody recently um, graduated from the PhD program at Stanford and is now founder and CEO of Coactive, an AI startup. Um, and uh, at Stanford, he uh, I was fortunate to be one of his advisors, along with uh, Peter Bayliss, uh, during his PhD. Uh, before that, he got his master's and bachelor's degrees from MIT. And uh, Cody uh, worked on a whole bunch of um, uh, exciting things. He's a co-creator of the Don Bench and MLPerf uh, benchmarks for machine learning. He's also founding a founding member of ML Commons. And his work uh, also uh, went beyond benchmarking to uh, designing more efficient systems for active learning, data selection, and uh, other topics. And we're going to hear about some of that today. Awesome. Thank you, Matei. Um, also, it's just a pleasure to be back and to see so many familiar faces um, here for the Stanford MLSS seminar. So thanks for having me. Um, so as Matei said, I'm Cody Coleman. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Coactive AI. And today I'm going to be talking about data selection for data-centric AI and why we should be thinking about data quality rather than quantity. And um, this work that I'm going to be talking about today was done while I was doing my PhD at Stanford, where mm -hmm. I was advised by Matei Zaharia and Peter Bayliss. Um, and I had the pleasure of collaborating with a number of amazing um, researchers at Stanford, uh, Facebook, and the University of Wisconsin-Madison. With that, I'll dive right in. So the unprecedented amount of available data has been critical to many of deep learning's recent successes. The fact that we have these large scale um, data sets and the fact that we can cheaply store and archive um, data sources from a variety of different, um, different domains and modalities has enabled us to actually create larger and better models and to train deep learning models um, to new levels of accuracy. However, big data brings its own problems. It's computationally demanding, resource hungry, and often, red uh, often redundant. This is especially true when we think about kind of practical settings where we kind of get data in the wild. We can end up with many redundant examples where um, they actually add no additional value in comparison to examples that we already have. And we can end up wasting valuable labeling resources um, as well as uh, 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 computational resources on these redundant examples. So um, if we're actually a little bit more thoughtful about kind of the way that we select data rather than just purely focusing on the quantity of data, we can actually save these valuable resources by eliminating um, redundant examples and focusing on kind of the more informative and unique examples. And to just give kind of an example of why um, uh, data selection can really save resources, if we were to think about a speech recognition task, Annotating at a word level can take up to 10 times longer than the actual audio. And if we do finer grain annotations, it can actually take up to 400 times as long in nearly a several hours. So this is valuable time that we have human beings just waiting and annotating this data. And if we use this time on data examples that aren't actually going to be valuable or that uh, beneficial, we'll end up using a lot of um, time um, and, and money spent on, on, this, um, on this data. And this is true of uh, kind of a wide variety of tasks, even such as locating entities and relations can take a half an hour or more, even for simple newswire stories. So in order to kind of avoid this like waste of resources, the effect of the, the problem that we're thinking about or the problem statement can be summarized as how do we efficiently identify the most informative training examples for us to, to label and to use for our models? 
And we're in luck. There's kind of a long, a long history of research and active learning, core set selection, and um, kind of other forms of data selection that actually answer this exact problem of trying to identify the most informative examples and quantify the value of um, examples uh, in large data sets. But there's an asterisk here that makes it uh, that makes many of these methods kind of problematic or intractable when we think about the modern scale of big data sets of large scale real world data sets. But before I get into that asterisk, um, let's just take a step back and talk about what, what is active learning. So active learning, the goal of active learning is to select the best examples to improve model quality um, or accuracy. And this is done through an iterative process. We start with a large amount of unlabeled data, and then we take some initial subset of that data and we label it. And then we train a model on this initial subset. And then this is where the, the really um, kind of key piece happens. We take that model and then we apply that model to all of the unlabeled data with some form of selection strategy to quantify the informativeness or value of these data points. And then we take those kind of highest ranking data points and we label them and we add that to our training set. And then we repeat the process where we train a new model on this um, larger labeled set and then um, apply that model to the unlabeled data and select the top ranking examples until we exhaust our labeling budget um, or reach some other um, stopping criteria. At which point we train the model one last time on all of the data that we've used or collected so far in order to use for our downstream task. Now, active learning is a really powerful data selection technique that can reduce the uh, labeling costs and focus kind of labeling resources on the most informative examples. Um, but it can be computationally expensive when we think about deep learning. And kind of in this talk, I'm going to talk about kind of two key points where this becomes, um, uh, where deep learning models become um, too computationally expensive. First, when we think about the iterative uh, nature of this process, we're training a, a, a model after each individual step. So we'll see that kind of when we think about these large deep learning models that take a lot of computation, actually doing that can be um, quite a large um, bottleneck. Um, and then when we think about kind of large scale data sets and modern data sets that we might have in practice with millions or billions of examples, doing this process of applying the model to all of the unlabeled data can then become a computational bottleneck and can um, be intractable at industrial scales with um, billions of examples. And to kind of tackle these two problems, um, uh, I'm going to talk about kind of two, two kind of simple but powerful ideas that we can apply to many different forms of data selection and active learning techniques in order to reduce the computational um, uh, reduce the computational expense of these methods and make them tractable for kind of modern big um, big uh, big data. And the first is selection by a proxy efficient data selection for deep learning, uh, which I was fortunate to collaborate with a number of uh, amazing people at Stanford and this work appeared in iClear 2020. So going back to this picture of active learning and the kind of computational um, bottlenecks that we might have, um, selection by a proxy focuses on um, the, the, the large model that we're potentially training at each iteration of active learning or each selection round. So in order to kind of get around this, this bottleneck and to kind of improve the computational efficiency of this, we made two key observations about deep learning models. First, deep learning models are actually relatively easy to scale down by either uh, reducing the dimensionality of layers or reducing the total number of layers. So here in this plot, we can see the x-axis is the um, training time um, uh, for various um, uh, models on a P100 GPU. And then the y-axis is the top one test error. And if we look at something like ResNet, ResNet 20, and we compare that to, to ResNet 164, we see that ResNet 164 reduces, only reduces the error by 2.5%, but it takes eight times as long to train. Now, we can actually kind of exploit this like diminishing returns to our advantage. Um, and what we find is actually that um, smaller, less accurate models, think like models like ResNet 20, are actually often highly correlated with larger and more accurate models for a variety of selection strategies that we might want to use for um, data selection. And then the second thing that we can do to kind of exploit, um, to kind of reduce the amount of time that it takes to, to select data 
is we can exploit the fact that the early epochs in training actually make the biggest improvements in um, the, the performance of the model. So here again, the, the x-axis is a um, training time in minutes on a P100 GPU. And we're looking at just one single model here of a, a ResNet 20. Um, and then the y-axis is the top one test error. And what we see is that almost half of the time, uh, a half of the training time is spent on a relatively small improvement of 1.4% um, in test error. So what we can do is we can actually stop the model early um, because we find that the rankings actually converge very quickly during training. So we get the, the majority of the signal um, as far as which data points are kind of more informative or more valuable very early in training. So we actually don't need to wait for the model to finish in order to kind of improve performance. So taking that together, taking those kind of two observations in mind, the fact that we actually get um, very high signal as far as um, the ranking of data points with models that are smaller and less accurate, we can use these models as inexpensive proxies, which led to our selection by a proxy approach um, during the data selection process. So rather than training or rather than um, uh, training a, a large model kind of at every single iteration of data selection, um, we can instead use a much smaller model um, to actually kind of rank and select each data point. And then we only train kind of this final target model that we ultimately want to use for the downstream test that's more accurate at the very end of this process. And surprisingly, even though these small, um, even though these pro proxy models are smaller and less accurate, we find that they um, still provide useful signal for selecting data points. And the target model that we ultimately want to train reaches the same accuracy at the end. And this allows us to accelerate data selection and active learning by, up, by close to 42x. So we tested this on uh, a number of large scale data sets for, from computer vision as well as NLP. And um, kind of across these data sets, we saw kind of a, a very similar process of um, being able to efficiently remove data with these small proxy models. So to begin, um, let's look at active learning on CIFAR 10. Now the x-axis here is our labeling budget, uh, labeling budget as kind of a percentage of the overall data set um, and how many points that we actually label. And then the, the y-axis is our top one test error. What we can see is that the gray line shows the performance that we would get when we train on all of the data, the full data set. Um, the black line represents what if we took a random subset of it and then the orange line represents what if we did active learning, this iterative process um, with a, a large model like ResNet 164, which is accurate, but it's slow. We can see that it significantly improves the, the uh, or significantly reduces the top one test error that we get over random sampling by doing active learning. Um, but again, it's a very slow process with this large model. Now, if we were to use um, kind of active learning or we were to use a, a ResNet 20 model, it's much faster to train as, I, as, as we saw earlier, um, but it's also less accurate than a ResNet 164 model. So we don't actually end up getting to the same like final accuracy if we just use a ResNet 20 model. However, we're in luck, we can actually get the best of both worlds by taking the data that was selected by ResNet 20 to train ResNet 164. And this actually ends up yielding um, a, seven, uh, a seven X speed up without any loss in the final accuracy of ResNet 164. And we actually see very similar results when we think about kind of larger and more complex data sets like ImageNet, where here we're using a um, ResNet 18 model um, to select data for a ResNet, um, a, a ResNet 50 model. And we can see that um, the orange line here represents the ResNet 50 model for um, active learning. Um, and we see that if we take the data from the ResNet 18 model and we train ResNet 50 instead on that data, we end up getting uh, effectively the same level or the same top one test error. And we actually found that, you know, across many, many different models, even of different um, kind of architecture families, that we actually have a similar high, high correlation. So rather than just like a ResNet 18 model for a ResNet 50 model, we can imagine using something like a MobileNet V2 or kind of other smaller, kind of more efficient model to do data selection and get um, even further speed ups. And finally, to really kind of put this to the test, we, we did active learning on the Amazon Review Polarity data set, which is a data set with millions of reviews from Amazon. And we took a very small, shallow model called Fast Text that only takes about 10 minutes to train on a laptop. And we used that to select data for a much larger, more accurate model, VDCNN 29. And 
even though um, fast text was nowhere near the same level of accuracy, we were still able to use that data that was selected by fast text and maintain the same level of accuracy for VDC and N29. And we sped up the data selection process by close to 42X. Now, what happens if we actually have a large amount of labeled data rather than um, kind of unlabeled data um, as we did in these previous examples? We can actually still save kind of a lot of, a lot of resources here in terms of computation. So large label data sets, where, where would that actually come up in practice? So you can have kind of setups where there's like systematic feedback. So imagine you're tagging friends and images, um, flagging emails as spam, or rating items or movies. When you have kind of a large um, kind of user base kind of doing all these actions, you can create this very large labeled data set. And also when we think about kind of self-supervised models, um, such as kind of in language modeling where we have BERT or in computer vision where we have SimCLR, we actually can kind of turn um, unla uh, unlabeled data and kind of define our own supervision here, um, creating a number of data points that we could select from to actually train these large um, uh, self-supervised models. Now in this setting where we have a large amount of labeled data, um, we wanna efficiently identify the most informative um, data points, labeled data points to train on. And here, this kind of lends itself nicely to core set selection, um, kind of specifically when we think about data selection techniques. And the goal of, of, of core set selection is to select a small subset of data that accurately approximates the full data set. So if we compare this to kind of the selection via proxy approach for active learning, um, in core set selection, what happens is we start off with all of our data, kind of all of our labeled data up front, and then we train a small proxy model on all of that labeled data. And then we use some selection strategy to kind of quantify the informativeness and representativeness of all of those data points and then select the most kind of representative subset um, that accurately approximates the data set for, to, for us to ultimately train this kind of much larger model that we, um, that we want to use for downstream tasks. And by doing this, we can actually end up speeding up the amount of time that it takes to actually train this, um, this large target model. Um, and as I'll show, we can get um, kind of a, a, an end-to-end -end speed up in time to accuracy of up to 1.6x, even on um, a relatively small and well-balanced data set. So to demonstrate this, um, in this plot, we're looking at uh, the x-axis is training time, and then the y-axis is top one test error. And we're training a ResNet, if we train a ResNet 164 model on CIFAR 10 um, using a P100 GPU, it'll take close to four hours to do that with all of the data. However, if we train a ResNet um, 20 model, it only takes us about 28 minutes. But that ResNet 20 model actually gives us um, kind of enough useful signal to filter out 50% of the data. And then if we train the ResNet 164 model on the remaining 50% um, of the data, we actually end up getting to the same level of accuracy, but we end up speeding up the, the time that it takes for that ResNet 164 model to get to that accuracy by 1.6X in end-to-end -end time. So that's including the time to train ResNet 20 to select the data and then to train ResNet 164 on the remaining data. So, so so selection by a proxy was kind of a first step at, at looking at the computational bottle, uh, bottlenecks of data selection for kind of modern um, big data sets. Um, and kind of more recent work, similarity search for efficient active learning and search of rare, uh, rare concepts. Um, I worked with amazing researchers at Facebook as well as the University of Wisconsin Ma uh, Madison to think about how can we go even bigger here? And this work will appear in um, AAAI um, 2022. So the, the key thing that we're thinking about um, when we think about really like truly um, large scale practical settings is like, how do we, how would we actually kind of deal with a setting where we have billions of unlabeled examples, uh, which might be the case if we're a large internet company. And we're thinking about something like, um, like recommendation. Maybe we're, we'll, we'll take a step back and we'll say we're at a large internet company and it's 2017. Fidget spinners out of nowhere are becoming this kind of new hot trend. And we might wanna be able to accurately kind of identify and classify fidget spinners to do recommendation, um, either for posts or for products. Well, um, we might start out with just a few examples of fidget spinners, but if we want a model to generalize well, we need to actually kind of capture the diversity of settings and diversity of, of fidget spinners that are out there in the wild. 
Well, we're in luck if we're at this large internet company, we might have a lot of unlabeled or weekly labeled data to pull from. Um, so there must be many more examples out there of this, this concept that we care about. And then really it's a question of just finding these examples um, that are actually the most informative. And once again, we can use techniques like active learning in order to do that. And this problem doesn't just come up when we think about um, recommendation at, 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 at internet companies or, or classifying um, things in, in social media. We can also imagine that, let's say we're an autonomous vehicle company and we realize that our, our cars are getting stuck behind delivery trucks. And the reason for it is that we, we have no way of distinguishing between, let's say, a, a delivery truck versus a normal car or truck. So we actually want to go back and we want to be able to accurately identify delivery trucks. Well, delivery trucks are only going to appear in a very small fraction of kind of like the time that we have this fleet of vehicles driving around. So we need to be able to find kind of those most relevant examples rather than just trying to label, blindly label all of the data about whether or not it contains a delivery truck. Otherwise we would waste kind of valuable time in both computation as well as labeling. Um, and again, we can use active learning in this setting. And then finally, we can imagine we're a large e-commerce platform and we have um, at the beginning of the pandemic, and we notice that people are, are posting and trying to sell N95 masks, even though it was socially unacceptable at the beginning of the pandemic because there was a, a shortage. Um, in this case, we're actually thinking about how do we kind of ensure the integrity of this, this marketplace that we've, that we've created. And again, we're in this kind of setting where um, an N95, con uh, N95 mask is actually relatively rare when we think about the total amount of data and the total amount of posts that we have on this uh, marketplace. So again, we're in this setting where active learning might be able to help us find kind of which of these like billions of unenabled examples we wanna, we wanna actually label in order to improve model quality. Um, um, and then also there's kind of a, a related problem um, or a sub area of active learning called active search, where rather than just trying to create an accurate classifier, we're trying to um, select as many positive examples as possible. So you might imagine we might do this in that integrity use case that I mentioned where we had an N95 mask, because we ultimately wanna be able to kind of take down those posts um, efficiently so that we can reserve kind of um, more N95 masks for the people that actually need it. However, we follow a very similar process in active search to active, um, active learning. The only difference is that um, we don't care about training a model at the end. Um, and the, the selection strategies that we would use are kind of are, are different because of the fact that we care about um, just the number of positive examples rather than an accurate classifier. Um, so without just for simplicity, I'm going to kind of just use the active learning diagram for both active, active learning and active search because they follow a similar um, iterative process up to kind of this last um, what we do at the very end of the process. But if we think about kind of the setting where we have billions of examples, you know, mm -hmm. Even, even if we do something like selection by proxy or we use a, a very small model um, kind of at each iteration step, actually applying that model to billions of examples can be just a, a massive bottleneck. So for example, if we're just running a single inference pass over 10 billion images with a ResNet 50 model, that would take about 38 exaflops or roughly 40 um, GPU months. So this makes, a, uh, makes evaluating all of the unlabeled examples just really too slow. Ultimately, especially when we think about kind of active learning and active search methods, which scale um, linearly or potentially quadratically with the size of the unlabeled data. Ultimately, in order for us to scale to these domains, we want um, these methods to scale sublinearly with the size of the unlabeled data. So to do that, we kind of make um, uh, a key observation. And we notice that like with all the recent advances that we're having in, in representation learning, we're finding that these pre-trained deep learning models actually effectively tightly cluster unseen concepts um, forming um, uh, uh, well-connected components. So to quantify this, we took a number of classes from ImageNet and Open Images, and we created a, a K nearest neighbors graph with a varying number of K um, ranging from 10 to 100 to um, 1,000. And then we plotted uh, the CDF of what was the size of the largest connected component. And what we see is that for like, um, uh, uh, for a reasonable value of K, we actually get very large connected components, meaning that uh, all these uh, kind of all the examples for the majority of the classes are actually kind of connected to one another. So rather than searching over all of the data for, um, 
for a specific concept, we actually can just we can focus in on kind of the the uh, the local neighborhood around the, the positive examples that we already have. So the key insight is that we actually don't need to look at all the unlabeled data. And we can start with those examples that are closest to, to um, the initial seed examples and over time expand our candidate pool. So to put this idea, this kind of simple um, idea in, into practice, we created similarity search for efficient active learning and search, um, which we abbreviate as SEALs. And to avoid this bottleneck, you know, we start in the same way. We take a large amount of, we have a large amount of unlabeled data. We take some initial seed set, either it's selected at random or maybe it's given to us. Um, and we train an initial model on that seed set. But instead of applying our selection strategy to all of the unlabeled data, we instead just find, we use similarity search to find the closest examples to our currently labeled examples. And we only consider them when we um, decide which examples to label next. And then we take the kind of highest ranking examples out of the small subset of the unlabeled data. And then we take those newly labeled examples, we find their neighbors and we repeat this process where we're effectively slowly growing this candidate pool of uh, unlabeled examples that we're considering as we um, label more positive examples and find their neighbors. Um, and the surprising thing is that even though at the very end, you know, once we've exhausted our labeling budget, um, we actually only end up looking at a very small fraction of the overall data to select these, these examples. But we find that the, the final model ends up achieving the same predictive performance, even though we've looked at only a small fraction of this data. And we tested this out on, a, a uh, on three large scale computer vision data sets, um, ImageNet, Open Images, and uh, a proprietary data set of de-identified uh, de and aggregated um, images from uh, public images from uh, a large internet company. So, to begin, we look at active learning on ImageNet and kind of as a simple baseline, we can see um, what, what is the performance that we get with full supervision, which will be represented by the dashed gray line. Then we can see and represent kind of passive strategies of random sampling over all of the data represented as random all uh, in the solid blue line. And as kind of another sanity check, we can just do random sampling over this um, candidate pool that we're growing at each step. Uh, which we call um, random seals, and we represent that by the uh, dash or by the dotted blue line. Then, kind of as our first real selection strategy, we can think about kind of most likely positive, where we want to select the examples that have the highest probability of being positive. So this is really useful if we're thinking about kind of an active search scenario. We want to get as many positive examples as possible. If we think about kind of the baseline approach here um, with the selection strategy, we're going to run over all of the unlabeled data. Uh, in order to kind of calculate uh, the probability that that um, example is, is uh, positive. But in the SEALs approach, um, if we're using an approximate similarity search or k-nearest neighbors method, um, we actually scale sublinearly with the size of the unlabeled data. And now we scale linearly with the size of the labeled data with some with uh, a factor of k representing the k-nearest neighbors that we look up for every single labeled data point. And then similarly, if we think about kind of active learning and uncertainty sampling, we can look at a method like uh, a popular method like max entropy, where we select the examples that have the highest entropy based on the uh, predicted class probabilities of our current model. And like most likely positive, the baseline approach is, scales linearly with the size of the unlabeled data. But um, when we think about our SEALs approach here, it will scale um, sublinearly with the size of the unlabeled data and linearly with the size of the labeled data. And we represent this by max and all, where that's kind of the baseline running over all of the data. And then max and seals is um, kind of our modified version where we apply seals to that. And then finally, to think about kind of a more complex selection strategy, we looked at information density, which tries to combine um, kind of max entropy, where we're looking at kind of regions of high um, uncertainty with also kind of balancing out regions of high density. So there's many other points that are around that. And we're not just looking at kind of a, a very um, uncertain outlier. And effectively we can look at this and we can think of the selection strategy as kind of um, uh, taking our, our score for max entropy and then multiplying a factor that represents how, um, how similar that 
that data point or how similar each example is to all the other examples. Now doing this actually scales quadratically with the size of the unlabeled data. Um, and you could do some caching to make it um, scale linearly after the first round. Um, but with our SEALs approach, uh, we again scale sublinearly with the size of the unlabeled data set. And again, scale linearly with the size of the labeled data set with some uh, multiplicative factor. And if we run this on, on ImageNet, we see that kind of the SEALs approach. So, so the, the SEALs approach is um, represented by the, the, the dotted lines. Um, ultimately, what we wanna see is that these uh, dotted lines actually achieve similar performance to the solid lines, the baselines that run over all of the data. And if we run these SEALs approaches on ImageNet, we find that they're all within 0.001, a mean average precision of the baseline equivalence for active learning, and within 0.4% um, of the recall for active search, but we actually only end up considering less than 10% um, of the data when we're actually doing this, this selection process, which allows us to scale, um, to, to um, speed up kind of the linear methods like most likely positive and max n by an order of magnitude. And then for something like um, information density, which scales quadratically in the first round, we can get actually um, a potentially multiple order of magnitude speed up there, depending on our labeling budget. Now, if we go to a larger data set like open images, where we have kind of uh, six to seven million images, um, we'll see kind of a, a even larger kind of um, performance improvements, where the SEALs approaches are still similar to the baselines for active learning, where we're within um, 0.0. Um, uh, one three mean average precision and within 0.1% recall for active search, but we're looking at less than 1% of the data here. So this gives us order, orders of magnitude um, improvements in performance in, in selection time for the linear methods of max, um, max cent and most likely positive MLP. And then for information density, I'll call out, you'll notice that there is no solid line for information density to represent the baseline. That's because even doing that first round, that quadratic round, did not complete within um, 24 hours. So we ended up having to kill that, the, those experiments. Whereas, uh, whereas when we apply kind of information density with our SEALs approach um, to reduce the amount of data points that we consider, um, information density actually scales uh, kind of more similarly to Maxent and, and MLP, and it makes it tractable on a data set of this size. And then to finally really test it, we actually got this proprietary data set with 10 billion images uh, to really represent internet scale. And we run our, our uh, SEALs approach um, uh, in comparison to the baseline approach and have real annotators um, label the examples. And we find that once again, SEALs perform similarly to the baseline approaches. While we end up considering less than 0.1% um, of all of the data. And what this meant is that, you know, rather than having to use a cluster of machines in order to kind of do this process of active learning, we could actually run it on a single machine at interactive speeds, where as, as a person in a Jupyter notebook, I can go and I can train an accurate classifier and find the relevant examples to train that classifier um, using the tools that I'm already, uh, already used, uh, used to. So to summarize kind of the, the key insights, we can actually improve the computational efficiency of data selection um, with selection via proxy and similarity search for efficient active learning and search seals. And by doing that, um, we've demonstrated that these powerful data selection techniques can actually, um, such as active learning and active search, can actually work on web scale data sets with billions of examples. So we can, rather than focusing purely on quantity of data, we can instead focus on quality of data. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much, Kuri. That was a great talk. And uh, I think lots of questions hopefully among the panelists, but also, um, I, I think we have a couple of questions in the audience and uh, want to remind folks on YouTube that please send out your questions in the live chat and we'll uh, get those across to Cody. Um, so I guess to kick things off, um, I th yes, I think the title of your talk was, you know, about um, quality over quantity, right? So uh, I guess one of the things I was curious about um, in all the work that you've done, you know, all these different uh, applications and papers that you've written, um, are there cases where you've seen that um, actually removing data um, helped model performance in some cases? I'm just curious if that's something that you've ever seen because in a lot of these uh, use cases, I imagine a lot of the data is very noisy and, and so actually removing some of the data might actually help. Um, so that was one of the things that I was just thinking about as you were, as you were giving your talk. 
Yeah, totally. That's a great question. Um, yeah. So, so I think you hit the nail on the head there with uh, a lot of data sets actually have kind of noisy labels and aren't uh, exactly right. And this can make it actually more complicated for a model to achieve uh, a certain level of accuracy. And we found that even on small data sets like, like CIFAR 10, you know, we, we stopped at, at 50% because our goal was to be able to get to the same level of accuracy as fast as possible, as if we kind of process the entire data. But if you added like a little bit more data in there, there's actually a point where you can end up with like higher accuracy because there's a small percentage of data that has kind of increased labels that are confusing the model and ultimately making it uh, kind of learn um, uh, basically like a, a false bias that doesn't generalize well. So even on a data set like on a data, a small curated data set like CIFAR 10, this happens. But when we think about kind of this larger data set with like billions of examples, it can be even worse there. Um, just because of the level of like noise and like duplication that we have in these in these examples, we can end up being very biased towards um, data points that that don't really matter into common classes and actually lose performance on those rarer classes just based off of the imbalance, the extreme imbalance that we'd have in the setting. No, that's 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 really uh, cool to hear. I mean, I, I I sort of had this you know weird suspicion that that might be the case, and uh, it's just kind of cool to see that you actually observe that in practice. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, and maybe one other thing that I'll add that I thought was kind of surprising about this whole data uh, skew or the examples that you would remove is that it's actually not like universal, right? Like it actually depends on each class. Some classes you can actually remove more examples, um, whereas classes that are very similar to others. It can be kind of difficult to do that. So, for example, in CIFAR 10, again, a very simple data set. Um, you can actually remove a lot of examples of, of ship, the class ship, because it's relatively, it's very unique in comparison to everything else. You know, it's like you have ships, they're in like the ocean, they're a very unique looking thing. Whereas like um, actually removing examples from the class cat versus dog, or like any of these kind of like animals, since there's cat, dog, and deer, um, that's actually harder to do because um, these, these classes are closer uh, in the, the latent space and kind of closer in general when you think about features. No, that makes sense. I mean, I think, uh, yeah, it seems like if you had things that were ship-like, you know, and, and there were more of them, then you maybe need more ship examples to actually uh, do the differentiation. As you said, if there were things that were, uh, you know, closer to ships in the latent space, then you might need more examples there, uh, yeah. which I imagine is the case uh, in 10, when you have 10 million images. Yep. So, Cody, I think, you know, this is amazing work in particular, whenever I see someone taking a task that runs on a cluster and making it like work in a notebook and at interactive speed. I'm always super impressed in particular if it's an important task like this. So it's super great work. I wanted to just to preface my questions with this stuff. <laughs> yeah. um, I have a couple technical questions that I'm curious about. Uh, one is um, in the last part of, of, uh, of the presentation, uh, my understanding, I may be wrong about it. So I would just want to clarify this. Uh, Hello. You're trying to it get is like a audio useful back. Prim a primitive that you probably already have up and running. So we're not actually, we can reuse effectively an existing um, K nearest neighbor search engine that you might be using to do recommendation or things like that um, for this process of active learning where we want to train a classifier rather than just say, let me get similar uh, posts. So again, similar research is a, a super popular technology by itself. Um, then the other thing which um, we, we go into in the paper is that actually you can use, um, when you think about the quality of the predictions that you have, um, kind of at the end, uh, you can actually use a smaller um, dim uh, dimensionality vector uh, and potentially a smaller like model for the similarity search without impacting um, the downstream performance. So you can actually basically end up um, using uh, smaller embeddings or embedding the, all of the data with a cheap model to generate the, the, the embeddings for similarity search. And then you only like kind of use a larger kind of model for embedding the things that are in the candidate pool where you're then gonna do kind of this process of active learning. So that's another way where you can actually kind of end up um, avoiding a bit of the cost of kind of doing that initial indexing and embedding piece of it. Right. Um, so yeah. That connects back to the first part of your talk, which I mean, that, that's the approach you had in the first part of it. So it makes total sense, right? It ties back to, to that. So it makes total sense. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 
And then the other little, uh, thank you for, for this answer, it makes, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, the other little uh, thing that I was curious about is uh, in the first part of the talk, um, I think the, um, uh, I had a question about, you know, the specific architectures, if the architecture should be similar in order to obtain that high level of correlation, but you already answered that saying that, you know, that's not really needed. You can get a high level of correlation also with other architectures. So then the question is to me, what is the threshold if there is a general threshold or if it's like data set specific threshold below which you wouldn't want to use a proxy and above which you think the proxy is very useful because if the threshold is very low then you can just train for one epoch even a smaller model just for one epoch why go all the way down but if the threshold is higher then maybe you can stop training that when you reach that threshold or something like that what's your take there yeah, so that's a great question. When we think about selection via proxy, ultimately, um, there's no hard and fast rule of how small of a model you can go or what kind of difference in art model architecture you can do. Um, so, but there, there is definitely a point where, and we saw this in some of our experiments where we did kind of very extreme things, as you're saying, like if you only train it for one epoch uh, out of like 180 epochs, you actually don't end up learning uh, enough to be able to kind of uh, appropriately um, rank examples. Um, now, it generally it varies a little bit with kind of problem to problem. So it's hard to give kind of an exact answer here, but you can also imagine that this is like another way, um, rather than thinking of like, um, you can represent it as kind of like a trade-off as well. So you could say, let's use the best model such that we complete this task or complete the active learning thing in an hour or eight hours or something like that. So instead define kind of the, uh, the proxy model that you use based off of your real world time constraints and then get the best um, kind of quality based off of that, um, uh, based off of that, that time budget. But yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. And you know, um, those two aspects, time and cost to, to, to train uh, and, and you know, correlation, you know, there's a, there's a Pareto frontier there to be explored, I guess, right? So makes the Exactly. Up. Thank you for your answer. Yeah, thank you. Hey, Cody, while we're uh, on the subject, I actually also had a question that I think was similar to, to something that Piero was getting at, um, but it's actually so about SEALs. You mentioned that these pre-trained, uh, uh, sorry, the, these pre-trained models can cluster similar concepts in embedding space pretty well. I was wondering, in your experience, what's the relationship between the pre-training task or the pre-training data and the end task and how, how well those are clustered? Um, I'd imagine, you know, if you pre-trained on ImageNet and test on open images, there might be some similarity, but have you had an experience uh, with, for example, the medical domain where the images could look very, very different or other specialized domains like that? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. So, so we, we kind of actually get at this a little bit, even when we look at um, a model that was trained on ImageNet, using that to embed all of open images. And then open images has a much wider variety of concepts than what we would see in ImageNet. And mm -hmm. there's everything from like, ImageNet is kind of like actually very nice, clear visual concepts for the most part. Um, you can think of different cats and dogs, different breeds like that, or like, uh, 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 maybe a stove, uh, pot and things like that. I've, I'm blanking on the exact, the exact classes, whereas open images is actually a little bit messier. So, so, so for example, like something that has visually distinct and that's like clearly an object that, um, uh, might make sense and that we've trained on in, in ImageNet, something like monster truck, for example, mm -hmm. it only exists in open images, but it's kind of like, it has similar visual features to like other cars and classes that we have in open images that works really well. Um, whereas you can get some concepts and some things that are just like, don't mesh really well, or kind of appear in like a variety of, um, kind of visual context. So for example, um, one of the classes that is in open images that doesn't work particularly well is something like sunscreen, because you might mm -hmm. have sunscreen on in many different locations and many different things, and that that domain might look different. Um, and then also like electric blue, like where it's a color that like you know, ImageNet doesn't train you to just uh, the model is not trained to predict like red, green, blue. It's predicted to predict classes, uh, classes. Um, and objects and electric blue kind of like breaks that as far as like a domain shift there. Um, now, if you think specifically, like if you use something like 
uh, ImageNet for uh, medical images, then that one, uh, you would imagine you have some domain gap there. I mm -hmm. haven't actually run that experiment yet um, for uh, going from ImageNet to like some form of like, let's say chest x-rays or something like that. Um, but one, one actually kind of powerful idea um, for these domains where you do have this domain shift is um, rather than like pre-training on a completely different data set like ImageNet, you can imagine with this rise of self-supervised models, we can instead um, use a self-supervised model on the domain of data that we currently have. Um, so maybe it might be medical images. So we get a good representation that works kind of at a base level based off of some self-supervised kind of modeling for, for um, the domain that we're actually in. And then as a result, you can imagine these examples and things like that are kind of appropriately clustered in this latent space. And then we can apply um, something like seals on top of those embeddings. Right. So even in these, oh, yeah. I, don't know, I was just agreeing with you. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, uh, so yeah. With this rise of self-supervised models, it actually kind of opens us up to uh, avoiding this domain sh uh, domain shift problem that we'd have in like ImageNet to medical images. Right. Yeah. That that's really interesting. The the electric blue example actually made me uh, think of an example that I've heard of before in data sets like iNaturalist, where uh, the differentiation between certain subspecies of birds is actually just the color. And then depending on the augmentations they use to train, you might accidentally lose those features. For example, if you put in a color jitter or something, suddenly you're training the network to not pay attention to the color. And then you have two species of birds that, that you can't differentiate anymore. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. So definitely the relationship between the task and, uh, uh, and, the, uh, and the domain of the images matters a lot. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to call out a couple questions that I saw in the chat around uh, what is the actual criteria used for uh, data selection in the core set case? So um, how do you actually select those points to create the 20%, 30%, 40% core set? Um, and there, uh, the, so this person, Matthias, is wondering for things like NLP tasks, uh, would you filter out some documents or sentences uh, and kind of what, what metrics and what intuition do you use to do that selection? Yeah, that's a great question. And this is kind of a maybe a high level point about about the work is that we ultimately wanted to both selection by proxy and similarity and seals are kind of selection strategy agnostic in a sense. We didn't want to like have to reinvent custom selection strategies. We wanted to kind of say like you know there's a wide variety of literature with selection strategies for kind of many different problems. Like NLP has its own kind of constraints in comparison to computer vision. Um, like, for example, like uh, we use entropy here for computer vision, but that doesn't exactly work when you have a sequence prediction task. You have okay. like a kind of like average uncertainty over kind of each token prediction and things like that. Um, so really, like the selection strategy kind of de depends on like the domain that you're in and what kind of makes sense there for that specific task. But SVP and seals can be applied kind of to a wide variety of selection strategies because they actually don't change the overall process in a sense, right? They just change kind of things um, uh, that are transparent to your selection like algorithm. So in the case of seals, we're just changing the pool of examples that you you basically calculate their scores and rank um, rather than being the entire data set to just some small subset. And then you can apply whatever selection strategy that you want. Um, for those for that domain and problem that you're thinking about, and then the same thing with with SVP, where again just kind of doing the same process, but we're making what is kind of a, a task agnostic um, change here in the fact of the the model that we're using to quantify the informativeness. Um, so that's like a high level thing that the the works of, for SVP and SEALs did not kind of specifically say a certain um, selection strategy that you had. But um, kind of concretely in the experiments that, that we, we did, we went with kind of popular examples um, or popular methods. There's um, kind of one school of thought that focuses on kind of uncertainty. So things like maxent, um, information density, where we're saying how uncertain is the model for that. Um, and then there's kind of another set of kind of metrics that focus on representativeness. So this is kind of let's say like greedy case centers or some type of clustering metric such that we select data points that kind of accurately kind of cover the space, the latent space that we have. Um, and these are metrics that kind of already existed in the literature um, that we use and adapt in this case. 
Um, and seals, you can do maybe a little bit more. And we have kind of a whole theoretical proof for kind of a, a custom algorithm for seals to actually show that it gets the same kind of optimal guarantees that we would expect in traditional active learning. Um, uh, but again, you can use kind of any selection strategy that makes sense. Gotcha. So it's really about taking this part of the pipeline that maybe isn't traditionally modeled in active learning, where they don't traditionally think of running the models expensive, but you know, the labels as the expensive part, and really making that part uh, cheaper and, and easier to run to and that's where you get get the get the benefit. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And like from a historical perspective, you know, a lot of the active learning literature and these techniques were designed when are, are run on data sets where there's a few thousand data points, not millions or billions. So um, they just like break down kind of when we think about this modern scale. Cody, I wanted to talk about, you know, using uh, proxies for yeah. core set selection. So, so to me, the intuitive reason for why bigger and bigger models perform, you know, better, but marginally better on, on these large data sets is because there's some training examples in our data set that have like very nuanced differences. And we get a larger model to be able to, you know, properly differentiate between them. So it struck me as interesting when you showed that a, you know, a smaller model uses a proxy can actually at least detect, you know, the interesting bits of data from the large data set to pull out a core set. And I was kind of wondering, you know, like, how does that make sense? I thought we needed a bigger model to be able to do anything with these little nuances. And then when you started talking about um, how in some cases, the large data set might have poorly labeled examples or some kind of data that we just don't want to use at all. Um, I was wondering maybe the small proxy model, part of the reason it does so well is because it can just as well kind of get rid of those bad examples. So Cody, I'm curious about, you know, I think since we're approaching close to the end of the, uh, of the time we have uh, on YouTube, you know, you, you, you mentioned this, this idea that you can now do things, uh, you know, in notebook, I think Piero was pretty excited about that. And, yeah. and I was too. Um, and I'm just curious if you've thought about that a little bit more, you know, like what are the possibilities when people can actually do these things um, on their, on their laptops with a single GPU maybe and and so on and, and, and you know, do you have any thoughts there? Um, and is that something that you're personally thinking about more? Yeah, totally. I mean, I, I'm super excited by just like the possibility of like bringing down the, the scale of these things so people can play around with it. And effectively you're making big data feel like small data. Um, so you can use the tools that you're already kind of familiar with and work with it easily. So there's a number of things that, um, and, and I think we're also seeing this in kind of the data centric movement as kind of a high level thing where we focus on just like the quality of this data um, instead. And, and one analogy that I always kind of think of that, uh, that is kind of nice is, I feel like the way that we think about like labeling and building data sets kind of currently or historically was almost like a waterfall method. You know, you kind of throw the process of QA and figuring out which example should be there over off to like another team. Whereas now when it's like powerful enough that you can just run it in a notebook as like a data scientist and stuff like that, and you only need to label a few examples. Um, now it's actually making it like much faster and kind of much more agile and really kind of across in other teams and things like that. Um, it also gives you empathy for the data and like what is confusing and what is hard. Um, I remember finding like I did a classifier for bowling was quite common. And uh, the bowling classifier, you know, you, you don't even think about it, but um, if you only have a few examples of bowling, like you, you like a, 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 an example to the model gets confused about is an exercise studio because you have like these like wood floors and exercise balls and everything like that, which like, you know, if you haven't seen that before um, from the model's perspective, like it's gonna be confusing. And like, but a priori as a person, I wouldn't think that like an exercise studio with exercise balls would be like an example that I need to include in my data set for a bowling classifier. So it actually like helps you understand kind of what is going on and, and what are these problems um, uh, and appreciate the data and the tasks that you're, you're, you're building the model for. That's a great answer. And uh, you know, like that, that example is pretty cool as well. Um, I can tell you spent a lot of time staring at images in these various data sets and, and seeing these weird <laughs> patterns, you know, like I think that, who is it that, that knew all, I don't remember, maybe Pierre, you know, this like, who knows all the dog breeds and ImageNet or something, maybe it's uh, 
Andre Karpazi or someone. But yeah, I think people who spend a lot of time looking at I think data it's Ludwig Schmidt at uh oh, at berkeley yeah that's right um yeah i think he gave a talk and he was uh, he had looked at uh way too much image net and and he was just like oh i i think i can tell the different breeds apart and it, it makes no sense why there are so many of them in this data set but um but you know um okay cool yeah i think we're, we're almost at time so i i want to thank you cody for uh for taking on time and i'm super excited to also see where where you uh take i don't know what you're doing at coactive but uh, but hopefully we'll see something cool come out of that. And and really excited to maybe chat more about that when you're ready. Um, and yeah, I think next week, I believe we have Ellie Pavlik. Yep, Ellie Pavlik from Brown. Uh, she's going to be talking about neurosymbolic AI. Um, so that sounds pretty cool yeah. and exciting. Yeah, and uh, as always, please uh, go to our website, mosys.stanford.edu to sign up to our mailing list and subscribe to our channel, like our videos all the things that you do for other YouTubers. So thanks so much and see you next week. Bye. Bye YouTube. Thanks. Bye everyone.